Well, good morning. It is a joy to be with you worshiping this morning, both here and online. I share with you that Bill and Michelle are in South Carolina, as you heard from, uh, from Kelly, celebrating the birth of their fourth granddaughter. So our, certainly our prayers are with Andrea and her family and Bill and Michelle as they travel home this afternoon. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of John. I invite those who are able to please stand for the reading of the gospel. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you are those, are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who were the ones that would betray him. And he said, for this reason, I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Having heard these words, let us affirm our faith with the historic words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. This week we are continuing our sermon series of Jesus asking questions. And when we talked through this sermon series several months ago, my initial impression of where we were taking this series was the questions that that Jesus might have of us and and, and the, the, the responses that we have. How do we respond reflects who we are in our faith. I... I feel as though this, these, these last few weeks have taken us farther than that. These are the questions that Jesus is asking of his disciples and causing us real pause in who we are and who we claim to be. I also apologize if it's a little warm in here. This morning we got word that the chiller had been off all weekend and it was a lot warmer in the 8.30 than it is now. And so you may not notice, but I have shorts on underneath. (laughs) Every year in the spring and and late spring, early summer, there are graduating classes from high schools and colleges that are participating in their graduation ceremonies. The pomp and pageantry of commencement ceremonies often include a graduation speaker. 
Sometimes that speaker is a, is a chosen member of the class, or perhaps it's a, an older adult who has been asked to speak into the wisdom that they have of leaving that school and going into the world, or going on to college, and, and the, the risks and rewards that come with that. Sometimes the speeches are humorous, sometimes they are deeply moving, but oftentimes they're filled with platitudes that we are all fairly familiar with. One of the most commonly used references in, uh, throughout graduation ceremonies refers, is, it uses the speech, uses the text from Robert Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken. These words perhaps are familiar to you. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. The graduation speaker then challenges the graduating class to do things differently than, they, than all of the others before them. Don't be afraid to take chances. Don't be afraid to make a different decision than, those, than everyone else in the crowd. Put yourself out there. And not to sound like a graduation speaker, but our lives are filled with choices. Some choices are simple, they're routine, they're, they're mundane. Some choices impact others, while some simply impact those making the decision. What time to set your alarm clock, what coffee mug to drink out of, which shirt to wear, blue or white. Our lives are filled with multitudes of mundane, simple choices. Robert Frost reminds us that in choosing the road less traveled, that makes all the difference. Be willing to take a risk. Don't travel a path just because everybody else has traveled it. Do not be afraid to go in a different direction. Distinguish yourself. Own your choice. Several weeks ago in our 945 service, we, we had a sermon that I preached that, that focused a little bit on the act of confession. Confession is, is good for the soul. It allows us to cleanse who we are in the presence of God. So I have a confession for you this morning. I can watch TikTok for hours. I know. There, I feel so much better. But in doing so, I have started following this young man who is through hiking. Uh, he is through hiking the Appalachian Trail, meaning he started in the foothills of Georgia and he's going all the way on the Appalachian Trail to Maine without really stopping. He'll get off the trail occasionally to restock supplies, but pretty much he's just hiking through, camping and sleeping where he can. And he, he submits three-minute videos each day and he uses the phrase, I love this, he'll, he'll say, just climb that mountain. Too easy, which I kind of love. It's kind of become his, his trademark, too easy. But every day as part of these videos, whether it's um, you know, finding some wildflowers or a waterfall or where he spent the night or where he's headed the next day, he focuses at some point the video on the signs that are used to, to, to determine which direction, which trail is going in which direction. Now, I could assume that, that he knows basically which way he's going. He's heading north. But I'm sure that there are also times when you can get disoriented. You know, there, you've, you've been in awe of a patch of wildflowers, or you've, you've taken a refreshing uh, bath in a waterfall, or you've been chased by a bear. I don't know. I don't know much about hiking. I don't hike the Appalachian Trail. I don't, I don't really like hiking or walking at all, for that matter. Now, in all fairness, I live at the bottom of a hill in a cul-de-sac with only one way out, and it's up. So I, I consider myself having a pass. But there are moments that perhaps he could get distracted and, and knows that one trail is going one way and one is the other, and he's trusting in those signs. He's got a compass, I'm sure. He's got probably an app on his phone that tells him exactly where he's going. But at some point in his travels, he is trusting, he's putting faith in those signs. 
that the sign that says, head this way north, is actually going to take him north. Our gospel reading this morning, there are those who are faced with choices. Those who have been following Jesus had experienced some of Jesus' most profound miracles that he had performed. They were, actively, they were active participants in the feeding of the 5,000. They had seen Jesus walking on water. They had seen healings that were taking place, especially healings on the Sabbath, all of which were garnering the attention of the authorities. And yet, for some, it was all becoming too much. Beginning in verse 60, John comments that many of Jesus' disciples, those who were following him from place to place, could no longer follow Jesus. They said, the teaching is difficult. Who can, who can accept it, Jesus? Unfortunately, these followers were not expressing their confusion over the teaching. Although it was, it was some re, it's some really meaty teaching that's happening just before this passage. Jesus has been explaining to those that are surrounding him that Jesus, I am the bread of life. If you are to be sustained, you are to feed on me. That was revolutionary. These followers understood what he was saying. There wasn't a language barrier of confusion. There wasn't some metaphorical confusion that they didn't understand. They decided that it was all just a bit too much for them. They were saying that his teachings were too difficult to follow. Who is this world that could live up to the expectations that Jesus was putting on his followers? They said, Jesus, we can't do this. So a group of people who had been walking and traveling and, and ministering with Jesus... They made the intentional decision, they had the choice, and they made it in that moment to return to their lives. They went home to the homes that they had left, they went back to the villages and towns, back to their jobs and their lives, pre-Jesus. I get a little emotional when I think about life pre-Jesus. We may, not under, we may not remember those moments in our lives. We may not remember our baptism. Hopefully we remember our confirmation. Hopefully there was a moment in your life, there certainly was in mine, when I better understood the love and grace that Jesus Christ has for me in a free gift given to me. And I don't want to go back to a life pre-Jesus. But there's a group of followers who had been watching and participating in all that Jesus was, who said, thanks for the ride, Jesus. This is all just a bit too much. We give up. Verse 66 says, because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer wanted, no longer went about with him. These followers made the choice, they made the decision to return to their pre-Jesus lives. Not only did they physically return to their homes, but they returned to their lives before they had ever met the Son of God. I really, really, really hope that there's never a time in my life when I'm having enough questions or enough doubt when I go, you know what, I give up. That's not to say that life is not difficult and that the times that our faith gets questioned and we get churned and pulled. But Jesus remains with us. Jesus is left to look at the remaining 12. The disciples that he's called together. He's individually recruited those, brought them on board. We know the stories. Jesus on the, on the, on the seaside calling out, come be fishers of men. He calls all of these 12 together. And he asks them the question. He's just had a mass of people walk away. 
And he looks at his 12 and he says, do you also want to go away? Jesus had hand-selected these 12s. He knew them. He loved them. He knew what their future ministries would look like. Yet he asks a question of them with the reality that some of them could answer the same way that that group that had just left had answered. Peter stands up at this moment. He steps in to the... You know that moment when you're in a group of of, of people together, whether it's a small group or a large group, and something really awkward happens. There's always that awkward silence. There's that, did that really just happen? Perhaps the disciples were just kind of shuffling their feet a bit, not really wanting to make eye contact with Jesus. Perhaps embarrassed as to what was happening. Peter steps up. Peter's going to answer the question. Peter had a choice to make in that moment. As Jesus' most trusted and beloved disciple, Peter now has to answer the question. But Peter has a choice in this moment. His rabbi, his friend, his mentor, his savior is looking him in the eye and asking him if he will stay with him. Peter responds with, Lord, to whom else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. You are eternity. There's nowhere else to go. Leaving you is not an option. How could we? We know you. We hear you. We see your teachings. And we believe. Our faith in you compels us to stay and to follow. How could we not? You have the words of eternal life. Peter gets it in this moment. Somebody reflected with me after the 8.30 service of, a, of the irony that I didn't mention in the 8.30 that I will today. It's only a few chapters later when this same faith of Peter who stands boldly in the midst of people who are leaving Jesus aside and he says, How, where else could we go, Jesus? You are eternal life. Peter denies him later. But it's in that moment. It's in that moment where the followers of Jesus have chosen to return to their pre-Jesus lives that Peter's faith was stronger than ever. In that moment, Peter was able to express to Jesus and to the other disciples the essence of faith, that Jesus is the key to life eternal. No one gets to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. We've heard these words, we hear them throughout the Gospels, and Peter is proclaiming them right then and there. Only you, Jesus. You are the only way. But the gift of choice, and it is a gift, it's the gift of free will that God has given to us, the gift of our ability to make thousands of choices each and every day that could have resulted in Peter caving to the whims of the group think at the time. He could have chosen to leave Jesus also. He could have agreed with the others that his teaching was too difficult. But it was in that choice in that moment that Jesus claims along with the other twelve that even acknowledging the one that would betray him Peter says you Jesus are the way sometimes our choices are not as simple as yes or no black or white khaki pants or blue blue jeans sometimes our choices continually evolve. Our, they, they move with us and grow with us over time. Peter's reaffirmation of his commitment to his Savior evolves over time into becoming the leader of Jesus' church the re- after the resurrection, death, and ascension of Jesus. Our faith journey, our faith journey has similar choices in it. Our faith journey has the potential of Peter, but also the opportunity to make those choices that Peter makes. Ours happens every day, every hour, 
We are, often, we are oftentimes given the opportunity inwardly and outwardly to choose to follow Jesus. Last week in our 8, 30, and 11 service, Bill preached a sermon about using the painting of the ship crossing the Sea of Galilee and the storm and the life that Jesus was in. He, in the 8.30 service, he told the story of John Wesley traveling in a ship across the Atlantic on his way to America. That ship was caught in a storm, and in the midst of that storm, John was terrified. Yet through the ship, he finds a group of Moravian Christians who are singing and praising God and praying during this horrific storm. And John is really taken aback by their calming presence on that ship. It begins for John a journey of inquiry into the life and the ministries of the Moravian Christians. John returns to England, continuing to find out more that he can about the Moravians. And as it turns out, there's a group of Moravians traveling through Europe on their way, and they're housed in England for about a week while they prepare to also go to America. They stay with John. John meets this young Moravian leader named Peter Bowler. Peter was only 21 years old, and yet he had a, a wisdom about him that John was really leaning into. John's faith was struggling. He was the founder of a Methodist movement. He was forming these small holy clubs. He was preaching dozens of sermons, sometimes a day. He would preach them all over the countryside, but his faith, by his own admission, was not nearly where he thought he should be. He was kind of suffering under not having what he believed was an adequate faith to be doing the things that he was doing. He saw in Peter and in those Moravians that overwhelming trust and faith that they had in God. He asked Peter, he said, how do you do this? How do you continue on? And Peter Bowler said to him words that would become part of legend in Methodism. He said, preach faith until you have it. And then you will preach faith because you have it. Peter was encouraging John to leave, to put aside all of the philosophy and the theology that he'd been studying and all of the ways that he felt that that would benefit his faith. And Peter Bowler was just saying, just preach your faith. And when you preach it, you will have it. And when you have it, you will preach it. And you will preach it and you will have it. It was a conscious decision on Peter Bowler's part to tell John and to practice himself, I just keep doing it. I just keep practicing my faith. I keep preaching it, and then I have it. It was John's choice to believe in that. It was shortly thereafter that John has his Aldersgate experience where his heart was strangely warmed. And he begins then to truly feel and understand what it means to be in the presence of God. And as a result of that, we are here today. It's choices. Our choices revolve around our faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. We have the choice every day. We have a choice to remain as a faithful congregation. We have a choice to individually understand and work on the relationship that we have with our Savior, Jesus Christ. We also have the choice to return to our lives that were pre-Jesus. I pray every day that my life doesn't return to pre-Jesus. There wasn't something... You know, it wasn't like one of these earth-shattering, transformational moments in my life. I just know, based on experience now, where my life could have gone had Jesus not been a part of it. We could all probably reflect on moments in our lives where we've relied so heavily on our faith, where we've relied on that relationship to get us through grief, to get us through hardships, These are the choices that we've made along our lives that provide for us the faith that we cling to. 
It was the practice of faith that Peter Bowler teaches John Wesley. Preach it until you have it. Believe it until you have it. Pray for it until you have it. Believe it until you have it. I can think of no greater a hymn to close our time together with than I have decided to follow Jesus. We have a decision each and every moment of our lives. We can decide to follow Jesus or we can decide like the followers that were following him who said, this is all just a bit too much for me. I'm out. Those are the decisions that we are allowed to make each and every day. This hymn affirms those decisions that we make in deciding to follow Jesus. If you would like to make this church your home, I invite you to join us at the altar during the third verse of this hymn. This morning, we had the pleasure of of welcoming a new family into the congregation, but we also had the opportunity to share with you that joining the church doesn't just happen here on Sunday mornings in the front. On, On Wednesday, we had Barbara Kronberg join our church. Barbara worships with us online, and she's not able to get out much. But she was able to get here with the help of some friends because she wanted to physically join this church. I think the picture you see is of she and Bill together celebrating her profession that this is her church home. That was her decision. If you would like to make this your church home, I invite you to come forward during the third verse. Will you stand with me and sing, I have decided to follow Jesus.